I'm Joe, and this is Sierra Specialty Auto. Thanks for coming by the shop. Today I'm going to finish up the uh, work on the compound of my toss lathe. Got a pretty good start on it in part one. Uh, let's get right back to the mill and finish up part two. I'm set up at the mill here with an edge finder. When I find it, I'll come in 1 and 19 30 seconds inboard of this outside surface. Uh, that's right in the middle of the uh, narrowest part of the dovetail. And we'll drill through with a 5 16 tap drill for 3 a 16 and then I'm going to uh, counter bore uh, the top quarter inch or so uh, to avoid any interference with this uh, fastener. Uh, for the moment I'm using, uh, this was a 2 inch, uh, 3 8 inch by 2 uh, uh, grade 5 cap screw. I machined it down off camera to inch and three quarter pretty close with a nice flat bottom and as little chamfer as I could uh, achieve and still clean up the end of the thread. Uh, so this will go all the way through and the counter bore will uh, let this uh, remaining few threads at the top uh, clear. So let's get started on that. There's zero and a hundred thousandths for the diameter of the, or for the radius of the tip, and another 594. That's roughly speaking an inch and uh, nine thirty seconds. Right there. I'll spot this with a hundred and twenty degree spotting drill. Let's see, I wanted uh, 1 inch and 594. That looks a little better. All right. And since this is cast iron, we're machining dry. That's all the way through. Now for the 3 8 inch clearance hole to clear the threads. About a quarter of an inch. drop this down and get my tapping tool in here. That's a nice sharp tap. I may have to counter bore a little more than that to get full threads down there. Let me see what I got there. Takes about an inch and three eighths to get all the way through that. I should have checked that on the tap. Inch and uh, five eighths. I got inch and a quarter. All right. I need to. I just need to counter bore deeper. I think I'll just I'll just do that. We'll counter bore. Uh, let's see. I can finish with a bottoming tap. Uh, I would like to have at least an inch, so I'm going to counter bore five eighths 
and I'm going to have to do it with the next size larger because taps for some reason are larger in diameter than the drill size. The drill size right on 3 eighths, fastener size a little under as usual, generally 5 thousandths or so. 10% uh, of the pitch according to this old Tony. And here we have a tap, and this is a good tap, 380. So I'm going to get the next size up and do a counter bore 5 eighths of an inch deep. Let's make it seven, just to be safe. Still be plenty of threads in there. All right, that'll give us room to let the tap down in there uh, and get close enough to the bottom that I can finish with a bottoming tap. And there will be clearance for the larger diameter of the tap. I may not need to do the bottoming tap. Nope, I'm going to need to bottom it. Still some incomplete threads. I'll get back to you when I've got that chased all the way through and, uh, and we're over at the lathe ready to start reassembly. I have the base on, bolts in, locked down at my preferred 29 and a half for threading. Get a little oil rubbed on here to get started. And start sliding this stuff back together. Ah. These pieces are pretty heavy. Let's, let's put a little oil on here too. came out pretty well with my hole. It's well clear of the inner chamber there, uh, full thread uh, all, all the way down. So that, that worked out quite well. That slides nicely. Let's get the gib lubed up. It's only, it only has one moving surface, but we'll put a little oil all the way around. This back surface is stationary.
Mm, it doesn't want to go in there. You know that came out in that direction and the fit of the slots confirms that. I found a slight burr at the tip of the thin end. I'm hoping that was the issue. And that does appear to be what was going on. Although that's still, that's still pretty tight. There is ever so tiny a bit of a bow in there. I don't think I dare try to get it out. I'm going to see what happens. I think trying to remember, I think this may have been sticking out a little bit this end. I would actually prefer that to be the case. Uh, that means I have, that means I have uh, travel left. Well, now she's trying to carry in. i got to get the other one in. locked in place so it doesn't move with the with the uh, top side. Feels, it feels pretty good. Get that uh, gib locked in place so it doesn't travel with the uh, top slide. And there's a stiff spot in here, but I can easily get by it. I have the gib where I want it now. Time to start feeding the, the screw in.
these are keyed. Only go one way. I was just thinking as I picked this up that I should have made uh, a witness mark. Whoop. There it is. That I should have made a witness mark, but since it is uh, drilled in an eccentric pattern, that takes care of itself here. I'm going to put just a little pressure on here with the with the impact driver. Those were very tight and I don't want them to come loose so I'm just gonna do just a little tap make sure they're fully seated Well, here's my brass shim washer, 5,000 thick. That key seemed to fit better one way than the other. That was the good way. And the 6 millimeter retaining screw for the first time in many years. I fine-tuned my cross-slide uh, locking arrangement a bit. I made a little dowel, 5 16 brass dowel, uh, tapped it 832 in case I need to fish it out of here. That drops down in the hole, should go all the way. There it goes. Then I got this uh, indexable locking handle from McMaster Carr. Let's see if we can show this. I machined it for an O-ring. I'm not sure if you can see the O-ring right here. To seal the top of the hole because the top of the hole is counterboard uh, for clearance on this thread. Uh, so this is uh, a spring-loaded uh, arrangement. You can uh, pull this handle up and turn it and index it to any position you need. And that's important here because the tool post is in the way. So I could slide this down in here. Uh, if the tool post weren't on here, I could swing it all the way around, but this illustrates perfectly uh, what you have to do is pull up and I'm using a screwdriver in the slot on the top to run that down till it gets close and there it is well, maybe need a little farther yep a few more there we go that's tight and I can pull this handle up and shift it around anywhere I like and it will register in that position so that's bound up pretty nicely that keeps this tight I like to keep the cross slide even with the back of the swivel base so that the pressures are transmitted from the tool post straight down through the corner of the cross slide into the swivel base and straight down to the apron and I'm saying cross slide and I mean compound from the tool post to the compound to the cross slide to the apron in a straight line without anything overhanging that's where I keep it uh, probably 98 percent of the time so that's got that done I can open that up and uh, have free motion of the uh, compound and lock it down and prevent it from drifting from uh, if, if there's a chatter in the cut or a vibration uh, sometimes this uh, uh, compound handle wants wants to uh, compound handle wants to unwind 
uh, under the pressure of the cut, and this pr will prevent that from happening. So I'm happy with this. We got got our missing hardware installed. We've got a shim in here to keep the the uh, dial from uh, being bound up uh, against the back plate, and got the locking device in here. Hey, we're good. This job's done. Well, that went pretty well. I learned a little bit more about my lathe. Got a repair done and a modification done that will make the lathe easier to use in the future. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you have a toss lathe, I hope you'll tell me in the comments what lubricants you use in the main gear box and in the change gear box. Uh, I'm reading uh, that the original lubricant was rather stiff and that it, uh, enough to affect cold weather starting. Uh, it doesn't get too cold in my shop, but uh, I, I, once in a while uh, I've read that some people are using uh, TELUS 68 or ISO 68, uh, which is a, a very typical uh, headstock gearbox oil. Uh, it's a little bit uh, lighter in viscosity. Uh, sounds to me like a good idea, but I sure would appreciate input from someone else with a toss lathe. Uh, again, I hope you'll comment. I hope you'll subscribe. I hope you'll come back and see me here in the shop again. Thank you for watching. A few weeks ago I mentioned that I was due for shoulder surgery. I had that surgery last Monday, today's Friday. I'm doing pretty well. This is what a one-armed machinist in recovery from surgery looks like. I'm in my easy chair, got a little table here next to me, got my TV remote, the mouse trackball for my computer, I got power director loaded up here for editing, uh, so I'm kind of halfway functional. I got a little bit of use, I can, I can do things with my hand here uh, that are within this physical envelope right here. Uh, I can't do any load bearing with it, I can't uh, lift it up, uh, so it's things like taking the cap off the toothpaste tube, things like that I can do right here, uh, perform pretty well. Uh, any, anybody who has uh, any kind of joint surgery, uh, check with your doctor. If you can use one of these things, you really need it. This is called a Polar Care unit. This particular one was delivered with a pad for the shoulder. Uh, they're also available with pads for other parts of the body. There's ice in here and water and a recirculating pump. It circulates water through this hose into my shoulder. Right here, let me get this up a tiny bit. Right here, that cold water circulates through and it's like a, uh, an ice pack, uh, but it's much more convenient, much more consistent, and it's safer. As long as there's a layer of cloth, uh, in my case, uh, my shirt fabric, between this and my skin, uh, I don't have the risk of uh, getting burned from the ice. So this is, this is a really great, uh, great thing. They're a little pricey. $240, uh, but it got me off the pain medication in less than 72 hours, and to me, that, that's worth it. It was a, a very good investment. He had originally planned to put uh, three holes, he said, about the size of a button uh, in my shoulder and go in with scopes in three places to identify and repair damage. So uh, he ended up going in eight different locations uh, on the top and down the side of my shoulder, uh, making uh, eight separate repairs of different types. Uh, and 
his estimation is that he did uh, a fair bit better with me than he had anticipated. Uh, he's got me, he, he thinks he will have more function for me uh, and a better, uh, better durability. Uh, but as always, uh, that remains to be seen after uh, six weeks in the sling, uh, padded sling with the big block of rubber to keep my arm away from my body. Uh, and then uh, physical therapy after that, uh, all, all that will uh, f factor into how well I do. And we'll just, we just have to wait and see now. It'll be some, somewhere between three and six months before I know for sure. But so far, I'm happy with what's happened. I came out of the surgery well, uh, off the pain meds uh, quickly, uh, and things are stabilized. Uh, no swelling, no inflammation, uh, only uh, some soreness, uh, residual soreness from the operation, but not really any pain. So I'm happy with that. So now we move on, uh, see how things go in, in uh, three to six months. And I'm hoping for the best, and I hope you'll hope along with me for the best. Thanks.